Hey, welcome to the 314th episode of Just Shoot It, a podcast about filmmaking, screenwriting, and directing. This episode is brought to you by patrons Greg C. Bolanos, Madison Witten, and Leela London. I'm Matt Enlow. And I'm Warren Kaplan, and today you got the esteemed Matthew Enlow. Is your name Matthew? I don't know. It is. It Matthew is. Enlow. Yeah, it, in the house. On, Back with another one of those block rock and beats. On the podcast, uh, along with... Uh, yours truly we are going to talk about filmmaking terms some terms that we use a lot when we pitch when we describe how things look when we describe how things feel it's a a sort of filmmaking glossary a very abridged one mainly about filmmaking styles and and how we like to talk about film we thought it would be fun Mm -hmm. to talk about that stuff but before we do that we want to tell you about our patreon patreon.com slash just shoot a pod it's a place where you can go Throw us a couple bucks, get your name mentioned on the podcast, become world famous to the Just Shoot It audience, and also help us out. Help us pay our editor, help us pay all our server fees. If you give us 15 bucks, I will personally mail you a Just Shoot It podcast hat. I did wear my hat on my last shoot. How'd it go? Any any takers? People did Just Shoot It. Anyhow, patreon.com slash Just Shoot It pod. Matt. I know you had a question for me. Yes, Oren. I've been dying to know, what have you been working on lately? Well, I just shot a bunch of spots last week. It was incredibly tiring. Let me ask you, I know this is not the topic that you wanted to talk about. How long do you feel like it takes you to recover, like get over the shoot hangover? There should be a name. We should coin a term for that. Yeah, shoot hangover. No, like a like a one word, mm-hmm. like a shangover, you know? I yeah, mean, like a show, show over? Shang over. Tweet at us at Just Shoot It Pod. I'm sure our listeners have a, a clever way to describe the come down. It's a combination of adrenaline running out and also sheer exhaustion that, that coming off of a shoot. Yeah. I remember. How many days was this last one? It was two shoot days, but it was the day before the shoot. We had the client there and we were like lighting and doing everything. And they wanted us to show them what everything was going to look like before the <laughs> shoot. Uh, and the day before that, we were building the sets, so I was there too. So it was kind of like four days. They were really mm-hmm. long. It really does take it out of you. I I just came off a, a three day shoot, and uh, I got soft mm-hmm. between the pandemic and just like a lot of single day shoots. I used to shoot for weeks. And I'm like, oh my god, take me days to come back. The producer at the end of the second day was like, I don't know. Do you think this is working? Should we try something else? And I was like, everyone's really tired. <laughs> <laughs> if you want us to do this, yeah, another one yeah. version, yeah, we can do it. But like, we're we're fading. Like the returns are diminishing. Like we need mm-hmm. to just like get the stuff we know we want and we're gonna use because we're very tired. I'm very tired. Yeah. I can tell the crew they know we still have like an entire other set to shoot, and we're now on like hour twelve. You know, it is a finite resource. Your crew's energy and morale and commitment. That's not a everlasting spring, for sure. Do you know what I mean? Like you, you have you have to wrap people. You have to, and it's easy to forget that sometimes when you get kind of caught up in the, you know, well, we gotta get it. Yeah, you know? especially in LA where it's like fourteen hours. It's not the norm by any means, but it's not mm-hmm. unheard of. You know. Well, and and also we're talking about fourteen hours for you and I, mm-hmm. which means sixteen for wardrobe. It's crazy, but it, it is good to have other people caring about the creative even when you're tired so that's kind of like the upside of having a creative producer that's like wait can this be better when you're like Mm -hmm. uh where's the camera so tired yeah so i did that and i was telling you before we started recording i just got offered a job kind of like a low budget commercial and i think i'm gonna take it i don't need to write a treatment so i kind of get the job and the rate the director's rate is fine it's not the worst rate i've ever gotten for doing a commercial and it just the budget is really small you know stretching the budget and trying to find a line producer that can make everything happen the person that offered me the job who's also a director that's directed a lot of you know tv commercials kind of said you know this is yeah this is not usually like the same standards and Mm -hmm. color grade and post product like crew like all the fancy stuff that you know we're used to and I'm, it's not that fancy but you know like having a fisher dolly instead of a doorway dolly that type of mm-hmm. thing he's like but yeah it's you know it's a relatively easy job and it can be fun so i was like yeah i guess i guess i'll do it you know sometimes i think especially in our line of work where we are 
pretty much like kind of, you know, journey people, crafts people that are doing this for a living. And we're going from, you know, we do gigs and we get jobs and we bid on things and this is our life. It's sometimes you don't want to take a job that maybe feels like it's a little bit of a step back or it's the type of job you were doing five years ago because you don't want people to think, oh, that they do these Mm -hmm. low budget jobs. Yeah. 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 So yeah, trying to figure out, but on the other hand, I'm like, I'm available that week. It's always more fun to shoot than not shoot. I'm going to get paid to do this, to direct, which is always right. The goal. Mm -hmm. No, I think Mm -hmm. no matter if you're Steven Spielberg or Mm -hmm. uh, someone that's just applying for film school, like getting paid to direct is that's the, that's the coolest part of it all. Right. It's like getting paid to have fun. So I mean, how do you determine that stuff? Yeah, the thought process is, has evolved for sure. I think the variables are how well is my career in terms of cash flow? How well am I doing on that front? You know, am I booking a lot of jobs? Does it feel like there's a lot of work out there? Are bigger, better things going to, are they coming down the pike? How much time does, is it going to take you? You know, I think sometimes I'll, I'll look at a job that, say, is in that budget range and doesn't need the fisher. And I'd be fine on the doorway dolly, right? Right. But does it matter? As a, as a metaphor, right? right? Right. But does it matter if the, like, do you need to love the creative? Well, so that kind of brings me to my final thing. So how, how creative can I get with the budget relative to what the creative needs? Right. And I just want to, sorry, just for our listeners yeah. that maybe are not so attuned to like the commercial or Hollywood world. When I say in love with the creative, I basically mean like, do you have to love the script? You know, the idea, at least. The other question to ask is, what else is going on in my life creatively? Because I can learn to find, I can find something that's exciting or interesting or, or a challenge in almost anything. Right. You can find the joy in a yeah. user-generated TikTok video. Of yeah. I love to work. I can cartwheels. try something. I can experiment. You know, you... I think to do commercials, I think you have to have that in you a little bit. But if I don't have my own stuff going on where I'm like excited about a script or taking something out or if if all of a sudden my sole creative outlet is this low budget commercial that I'm forcing myself to figure out how to love, mm-hmm. that can be demoralizing. And so it's kind of about the bigger picture in a certain sense. I do know what you mean, but I feel like I have the opposite problem, which is I know I have this passion project or this thing that has big potential, like a higher risk, higher reward type of situation, like pitching a show, for instance, Mm -hmm. or writing a script. And when a paid job comes up, I am not good at turning it down so that I can continue on the Mm-hmm. more creatively rewarding things. I'll be like, oh, okay, yeah, I'll take a quick break. I'll tell whoever I'm working on the other thing on with, hey, sorry, I got this job, you know, let's check back in next week. The reality of like having to put projects on hold because other things come up, that is the nature of being a creative in Hollywood. Right, probably Period. even out of Hollywood. Yeah, even out of, yeah. Steven Spielberg has to do that. Some stuff gets greenlit. Uh, someone becomes available, whatever, you put things on pause, right? So that's fine. The difference is if like your show didn't sell, you've got writer's block and the script that you've just been working on, you realize Jordan Peele just sold the better take of that idea that you're working on and you're just dry and demoralized and haven't, if you feel, and what I'm saying is if I'm depressed and don't have any good, good ideas, then the, the commercial that isn't maybe necessarily totally my cup of tea feels worse than if I'm like feeling good and waking up and writing every morning and I've got stuff going or even if I, you know, and I have to put that on the back burner to make a living for a week. I'm okay with that. That's fine. It's just, I want to be thinking about and excited about other aspects of my creative output. That's all. Right. Yeah. It's all a mind game. Do you know what I mean? And I think it's important. The time thing, you know, you're not writing a treatment. It's relatively straightforward. So like, this is going to, you're just going to bang this out and have a nice time doing it. 
that's an easy yes to me. Yeah. You know. But I will will probably have to call in a few favors and get mm-hmm. some crew to work mm-hmm. below their regular rates. But I'm also going to Hawaii for a week with my family. And this right. will shoot the following week. So it's not like I'm gonna be Ooh, yeah, prepping well, any bigger job in that time. Yeah. That's a that's a hell yes. That's a nice transition to a similar sort of situation, but kind of the flip side. The jobs that I have been working on for the last couple of weeks now have a lot of creative freedom and low budgets, basically. And I did do the thing of calling in some favors, you know, some crew members that like I hadn't worked with in a long time who I knew would be great and we didn't have a second AC. You yeah. know, I slayed it a lot and it felt awesome. It felt awesome. Yeah. And and also like your hope is that it kind of that creative freedom inspires your crew and they kind of rise to the to the job. If you can create an environment where that's clear that, that that's what they're signing up for from the get go and like we know the rate isn't good, but like, you know, we're gonna do some weird fun stuff real quick. And it worked. So hopefully the client likes it. I guess I'm just bragging right now. I had a nice shoot. (laughs) Good. (laughs) Yeah. You know what, though? I I guess maybe the moral of the story is it was so hard. Right. It was like we were sweat, sweating, genuinely sweating really hard. But like not having client on set, there were moments where I would like call cut, feel like I was personally ready to move on. And then have that like the little the little client on my shoulder being like, do you need one more? You know, or like, should you get this insert you're not going to use just in case you need another point? Right. It was interesting to feel not even self-doubt because I knew what I liked, but I was just like, because I couldn't get sign off from people in real time in the moment, it created an extra layer of apprehension on my part. That was interesting. Yeah. I live in that. I Apprehension is my middle name mm-hmm. on, on jobs yeah. like that. When they're like, can you just go get a couple of shots of this? I'm like, ah, a couple of shots means like 20 shots just in case I get, mm-hmm. you know, they have something yeah. else in their mind than I'm imagining. There was no one there to say, hey, I think we need a couple of those shots. Right. So you, and so you just person. get the shots that you get and then hope that they're not like, oh, oh, I, now I understand what you meant. And that whole issue of clients telling you like oh well we saw this c stand at the end of this take and you're like well we're never going to use that and then they're like well can mm-hmm. you just do another take and you're wasting a lot of time doing those things that don't matter well i'm glad we both had good shoots and we're both very tired from them <laughs> still <laughs> i know still i mean yeah. i'm sure a lot of it has to do with the fact that we're like waking up at like 6 a.m with these babies <laughs> That we have. My baby is waking up even earlier now. Oh, man. We need to have a talk. As soon as she can speak, I'm going to be like, hey. Hey, cool it. Well, on the topic of filmmaking and trying to figure out what the heck we're doing, we wanted today to talk about some of the terms that we use when we describe the type of work that we're doing or that we're pitching. The shorthand that we use to explain things to people mainly like the style of something or the feeling of something it's something we use obviously in commercials all the time but you could use in pitching in episodic work in movies and we wanted to talk about some words that come up a lot and what matt and i how we define them and how we execute them what we mean by them yeah Yeah. because i think it's interesting the first thing i wanted to talk to you about is what the word cinematic means and comparing that with the word commercial and the word stylized, because those are three words that I use. I actually don't say commercial that much because I'm mainly working on commercials, but I do use the word cinematic a lot and I use the word stylized a lot. And I was curious to know how you define those words and if you if you even use them, because I think each filmmaker, part of what makes you unique is the words that you use to describe the stuff you're working on and how you even think about it. Yeah, I mean, I think that a lot of the terms that we're going to go through on this list, oftentimes they're meant to evoke evoke things in people and excite people. They're like a little bit more producer and client and investor facing, I would say. Like, I don't know that I would ever say to my cinematographer, hey, this one needs to look cinematic. I take it back. I have said that to DPs before, but like, I think we both tend to drill down relatively quickly. It get a little bit more prescriptive, but the, these umbrella terms, I think, are valuable in terms of 
just decoding what we mean when we say them. Cinematic is the one that I cringe at maybe the most out of this entire list. And I think it's because it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. But to me, cinematic tends to mean shallow depth of field, low contrast images. Yeah, stuff is out of focus and stuff is darker than it is brighter, basically. But there are shadows, so there's contouring, there's dimensionality in the image. Whereas like commercial, you know, or I would say sometimes like ABC style or something like that. What do you mean by ABC? Like the network? Like the network, yeah. Like a bright pop. Poppy, you know, yeah. Poppy look evenly lit three-point lighting or even just like big soft sources and brightly colored which is funny because like bright colors could be cinematic in another sense i think the cinematic is like a shorthand for prestige right Mm -hmm. the difference between an hbo show and an abc show is maybe what people mean by cinematic versus commercial right like if you compared the show hacks to blackish for mm-hmm. exactly that yeah that's a perfect comparison yeah and uh neither is better or worse from a stylistic or visual standpoint right um, but if you yeah. looked at where like the darkest colors and the brightest colors in the frame sit when mm-hmm. you'd see they're a lot more stretched on blackish than they are on hacks and if you mm-hmm. look at the saturation how colorful everything is probably much more colorful on the abc show blackish than it is on hacks uh, and even when you see like how controlled the color palette is, the more cinematic show, you know, I think you look at a scene and you you hear about cinematographers saying like, well, I think this scene is orange and I think this scene is green and this scene is pink. And you talk to the art director or the production designer, they'll have similar ideas of color. And not that you don't have that on blackish, but I think you would. You, you 100% do. on black. Right. But you would maybe <laughs> care more about the colors a character wears. Mm -hmm. in the scene at the school than what the school looks like, right? A little more character-based than environment-based. Cinematic has like an an inherent snobbery to it. Yes. Which is, that makes me cringe, actually, because I think that there's a value judgment on a certain type of filmmaking that is quote-unquote good versus not, and that that makes me frustrated and angry and mad. But I think, you know, you can call it snobby. I... I always wish that my commercial reel was more cinematic because if you go mm-hmm. go to my website right now, directedbyorn.com, I've gotten feedback that I'm not the right director for a job because they are looking for more cinematic type of mm-hmm. work on the mm-hmm. reel. And and I would agree with you 100%. Yes, the shallow depth of field for sure, but it's it's a little bit more, like the more specific way I would think about it is that using focus as a storytelling tool is probably a more cinematic thing. Um, definitely, you know, less contrast, more kind of natural lighting. You know, you you uh, want like everything motivated from the lighting to what the characters are doing mm-hmm. to the location to so the art direction. Right. Whereas in a commercial, sometimes it's like, hey, this is for Walmart, so we want everything to be blue. <laughs> mm-hmm. That that's your motivation. I think that I would maybe say rich when some people say cinematic. Do you know what I mean? Again, again, I think that it's, it's like a, you, you want to kind of boil down. If I was ever to say like, oh, this is going to be so cinematic, I would kind of immediately follow up with the ways in which I would enumerate. Right. I mean, my issue points. sometimes is like, you know, you can have like a 5D and shoot stuff at golden hour, like a mm-hmm. couple walking up a hill handheld mm-hmm. and crop it in a 239 aspect ratio. Mm -hmm. And they're kind of silhouetted and that's cinematic. And that's like, wow, look at this filmmaker. They're cinematic. And then I take, you know, some. Which is exactly what I would have done in film school if I was, if those tools existed. And I take some. Like if I was in film school right now. Yeah. That's what would have happened. (laughs) Some middle-aged celebrity and put her against the pink wall and make her look good, bright and saturated and flattering. Like, I think the second thing is a much more difficult thing to accomplish, you know, to do mm-hmm, well mm-hmm. than the first thing. But uh, I do feel like sometimes that is looked down upon compared to the quote unquote cinematic thing. Because what I'm shooting, by the way, has to be one by one safe and 16 by mm-hmm. nine. And nobody mm-hmm. wants a super wide screen. <laughs> That's what bothers me sometimes. You see these reels and like, look how amazing this reel is and how cinematic it is. And I agree with them. It is. But a lot of times it's like the aspect ratio is something that I'm literally Mm -hmm. not allowed to do in a lot of the work that I get, you know? 
celebrities against colorful backgrounds. So let's talk about stylized, which is the third term in this first bullet for us. So to me, stylized, so the shoot I just did was stylized, what I would call stylized. And it's funny, uh, we shot four spots in four different bathrooms and each bathroom was a color. So we had a green bathroom, a pink bathroom, a yellow bathroom, and a blue bathroom. And we went all out, like the walls were blue, the tiles were blue, the floor was blue. I know I just said that I think of cinematic as more, a more controlled color palette, This is kind of the opposite. This is putting it in your face. Like this is the blue set, almost like you have that uh, on your website. I think you're, uh, there's a photo of you on a blue set. And I mean, you can't get more stylized than painting every single thing on the set, the exact Mm -hmm. same blue. To me, stylized is when you're almost calling out the tools that you're using, you know, a shaft Mm -hmm. of light or like a light gag, right? Which by that, I mean, Mm -hmm. as the lighting is changing in the shot, a spotlight comes onto someone or something that's stylized yeah i mean maybe a way the the thing that you're describing is like something that pulls you out of the reality of the the storytelling of the storytelling yeah yeah or not pulls you out of it because i think it draws you in but i think reminds you that what you're watching is not quote-unquote real life right Right? like there is an artificial hand guiding your eye and telling you how to feel and all that and i think that that is maybe a a good catch-all kind of understanding and of what you mean when you say that to different people, but also like having lots of style, quote unquote, euphoria Mm -hmm. is a very stylized show. Right. What about the Coen brothers movies? Would you call those Mm -hmm. stylized? A hundred percent. I would. Yeah. And cinematic somehow at the same time, I have trouble. I either am pushing towards cinematic, which by the way, to me is obviously it is the look primarily, especially when you're showing someone a reel, but it's also pacing. It's um, the amount of dialogue. A lot of the commercial stuff I work on is di- like from the first frame of the commercial to the last frame of the commercial, there is dialogue. Wall to wall. Yeah. yeah. Which is like, to me, cinematic work. The visuals are doing a lot more of the storytelling than the dialogue is, you know, and maybe more, it's more about sound design. It's more about like breathing in the moment, experiencing mm-hmm. things. Even it can be fast paced and like action packed and visceral, but it's not words telling you what you should think Mm -hmm. and stylize things. You know, I think of sometimes it can be super high budget, but it can even be like, you know, the Dollar Shave Club commercial where a guy is walking around saying a bunch of funny things and crazy things are happening in the background. To me, that's really stylized and not very cinematic. The next level of explaining what we mean, I think actually brings us to our second point grounded versus broad right which is addressing kind of the tone and the performance of your actors right Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah exactly just almost immediately i would equate cinematic and grounded together right most of the time and commercial and stylized with broad talk to me when you say grounded what do you mean i mean that the environment feel it you're trying to emulate real life uh and same with performances. So the characters are saying things that they would really say, even if the situation they're in is totally absurd. And I think Geico commercials, which as many listeners, longtime listeners know, are like some of my favorite commercials. There's one of my favorite ones is where there's a secret agent. He's trying to get a helicopter to pick him up off the top of a building as he's fighting off the bad guys. And he gets a phone call. He thinks it's the person with the helicopter and he picks it up and it's his mom asking him what he's doing. And she's knitting at home and talking about Zumba class. And the whole premise of the commercial is like that your mom always calls at the worst time, no matter, no matter who you are. Right. So the premise is absurd. It's like an action movie and a mom that's just so the exact, totally exaggerated mom. She's sitting in a suburban house with squirrels outside the backyard, she's knitting and talking about Zumba class. It all feels like broad and exaggerated, but the performances of the people of the characters feel really grounded to me because the mom does feel like she would say those things. That sounds like something my mom would say. And the, you know, secret agent action guy is saying the things that he would say. So to me, broad is more like, Fred Armisen, you know, saying something crazy in an old Navy commercial or Terry Crews yelling, you know, Mm -hmm. like kind of in an exaggerated way or even like the Tim and Eric stuff or Eric Andre 
you know, mm-hmm. just doing totally insane things that yeah. I think of as a broad. I'm with you. Grounded, I think, is it would easy just be to, nice to say like, oh, naturalized or something like that. I, I don't know that like a heightened high concept idea like the Geico commercial you outlined, mm-hmm. I would call grounded, but I would certainly say like, oh, it's a heightened idea with grounded right. performances. And right. that and that's where I use the word grounded the most. Because mm-hmm. and that and I think that's what makes things interesting is when you have a super stylized visual like sure. um like that movie Sorry to Bother You, Boots mm-hmm. Riley movie. Super stylized, you know, filmmaking world. Yeah. yeah. But with kind of grounded motivations and Mm-hmm. characters it spirals into like total insanity by the end i can't even think of like broad acting in like big movies because i think of it as a ne- negative i guess yeah broad to me actually is is a slightly different thing broad it's almost like is, sitcom like like it's the opposite of dry or wryness right. right broad to me is like something that literally everyone can get right it's not specific it's not narrow it's broad. So like slapstick. Yeah. It's even some of that James Corden stuff, which I, you know, I, I yeah, love. Exactly. I think it's very funny, but it's like, ah, like he's literally running yeah. singing in the streets. He's indicating that it's funny. He's selling the joke. Right. And, and I actually, it make, makes me think of my philosophy with on a joke by joke basis is that I think the harder quote unquote joke is the sharper it is, the less you sell it. Right. So, you know, if on the page, the script says James sings. Mm-hmm. That's not a super sharp joke. Sings a note. That's not a super sharp joke. That's like, you know, you got to really put some spin on that to get a laugh out of just singing, right? If someone just went la, mm-hmm. that's not funny, right? But if James Corden goes la or whatever, I don't know right. how he would do it. <laughs> you know, he's selling the quote unquote joke harder and that is broader, that's more like a, if a kid would laugh at it, that's the thing. That right. I guess is, it, is that where it comes from? The broad audience? I think so. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Grounded versus broad. It's like naturalized, realistic versus indicative or something like that. Right. Heightened. Yeah. And again, I think you can use grounded about the premise and absurd about the character, like an mm-hmm. SNL sketch. Sure. Or yeah. grounded the character in the performance, but broad is the premise. It's like, yeah you know, aliens are invading us and you're trying to figure out if you can get a better deal on, you know, two buy one, get one free at pay less shoes mm-hmm. or whatever. I think that people use broad as like a derogatory term pretty frequently. Appealing to a mass audience isn't necessarily bad. And I think that like oftentimes they mean when someone says something is broad about a performance, then it's just truly derogatory. But like if it's quote unquote grounded in something relatable something specific then you get away with murder um, murder yeah you know being more presentational with your performance style yeah and i think there's something that's kind of slightly related to broad which is the term on the nose which sometimes you know i think people use that term to mean something super obvious right you're doing the most obvious Mm -hmm. thing like this grandma is coming in and she's got like a tiny little poodle and like a Mm -hmm. scarf and giant sunglasses and a crazy tan that feels broad because it's on the nose because it's the most obvious thing or familiar tired yeah overly familiar the word that i use a lot is like random like one of my pet peeves is comedy that just feels random like oh and then this thing nobody expects happens to me as a general rule of how I work on stories and approach things is I try to put the premise and the tone a little far away from each other, you know, Mm -hmm. a super relatable grounded idea, but executed in kind of an extreme way Mm -hmm. or Mm -hmm. vice versa. In a surprising way. Yeah. 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 A kind of crazy idea, but as if, you know, we really have to deal with this thing and it's very grounded and, and small because when you don't do those, when, you have two really grounded things, you get drama or melodrama, mm-hmm. you know? Sure. And when you have two extreme things, you just get wacky junk that unless you're Tim and Eric, you can't really get away with. I'm glad you brought up Tim and Eric because I think that like generationally there is maybe like younger people tend to like more random, like non sequiturs. I think like there have been many think pieces about how like 
Generation Z has a different sense of humor than millennials right. do. Like that TikTok stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I would argue that most of that stuff actually does have game and that most of the time the game is just surprised. Right. Like like what is the most random thing? What how are how can we surprise someone in ways that they don't see coming and are stranger and stranger and escalate that way? Right. So if there was say a spot where you know, every time you cut, I, I did a, 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 a American Sniper parody. Mm-hmm. Do you remember when yeah. American Sniper had uh, the fake baby, uh, the, the fake baby? And it was kind of, it was nominated for an Oscar and this and stuff. Every time we cut back to the, the fake baby, it was a more absurd fake baby. So at right. first it was just a doll, doll and then it's a sack of flour and then it's the dancing baby from Ally McBeal. Right. But that's still a very clear there's a logic to what makes it funny, and the fun is in being surprised in the different ways we'll zig and zag. Right. So another word that comes up a lot is narrative. What What does that word mean to you? Yeah, scene work. The camera is in the third person or omniscient, basically. The, no one is aware that there is a camera there and that a version of reality is being presented to you. Would you say that House of Cards or any show where the main character... I've been watching that that Lakers show, the new mm-hmm. um, Adam McKay show. I'm actually sure, really yeah. enjoying it. And the, even Modern Family, you know, the characters are constantly looking into the lens and checking in with the audience. Mm-hmm. Would you say mm-hmm. that those moments are non-narrative? Mm-hmm. I, that, it, it, he, so I would say here there's a delineation between um, narrative, like say, the office or or um modern family where in the reality of those shows the camera is a character or rather the camera operator the documentary crew is a character exists that exists whereas fleabag or um house of cards those are shows that are breaking the fourth wall in a way that's different right? right like they are acknowledging oh you the viewer at home and because there's no layer or veneer of a documentary crew, um, there there is a distinction between them. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas maybe on the the furthest end of that extreme is a commercial where a spokesperson is talking directly to camera, and we all know that they are meant to believe that they are talking explicitly to that audience. That right. there's no facsimile of them not being in a real world of any sort, right? Right. Fleabag and, and House of Cards are kind of in that gray area, basically. Really, what we're trying to say is narrative is characters talking to each other and direct address is someone, direct address is someone talking to the lens. Right. It's kind of, when, when, when we say narrative versus direct address, that's typically what we mean. Basically. Yeah. What's funny is like in all commercials, and from my experience, we use the word story a lot. Even if it's somebody looking into camera and telling you why a Maytag dishwasher will last forever, we're still, at least from an advertising standpoint, there's still a story, which is the story is you'll never need a dishwasher repairman. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Because Maytag will last forever. And so your repairman is just bummed (laughs) because he's got nothing to do. (laughs) Right. That's the story. Even if it's just him looking at the camera telling you that he hates Maytag because puts him out of a job but narrative as a style yeah i i would define it i think the same way as you which is we're watching a scene play out and obviously in film and tv scripted tv and scripted film it's like 99 percent narrative i think in commercials again those more cinematic spots you know a uh, mom gets a dad a new Mm -hmm. audi suv for christmas that that's like a narrative spot right we have kind of a beginning middle end we have scenes we have suspense we have characters and reveals whenever i do work on narrative stuff i like to use it because i i think it it, it's a word that makes me feel good at least i think people like that word (laughs) yeah (laughs) i don't think anyone likes the term direct address Uh, (laughs) though i will admit that Recently, in the last couple of years, most of many of the jobs I've gotten have been because I have a lot of actors looking into the camera Mm -hmm. (laughs) and saying things. Hey, do you have this problem? 
Yeah. Our product will fix it. Yeah. Here are the ways in which all of the our product is better than the other product. Yeah. And especially celebrity stuff. So that mm-hmm. when people pay celebrities, you know, half a million dollars to be in their commercial, sure. they really want that celebrity to look in the camera, tell the audience mm-hmm. why they love a product. <laughs> That's right. And they w- really want them to say the name of the product, which rarely happens in narrative stuff. In narrative stuff, you wouldn't have the dad say like, wow, you got me an odd, Aud- you know, an mm-hmm. Audi. So thank you. You know, you would just kind of see it play out. Let's move on to our next kind of comparing and contrasting of terms, which is something that's designed or composed or art directed versus something that's, and I put these in very big quotes because it's definitely the buzzword of the century, authentic or improvised mm-hmm. or natural or mm-hmm. kind of like a fly on the wall. Like we're just, we're just tuning into to something that's already happening. Do you use any of those words when you're pitching or talking or describing? Without things? a doubt. I will use designed. And what does design mean to you? Designed means that the artifice of the filmmaking is embraced a little bit, right? Like like almost Wes leaning. Anderson style, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a great example. Yeah, yeah. So the, when you say Wes Anderson, you really mean a, a handful of, of, of traits, right? You mean 90 degree compositions. Mm-hmm. You mean a ton of art direction art direction but but from a specific era you know you don't ever see a cd player in a wes anderson movie you see a record player for instance right yeah but i think even there's something just so kind of presentational Mm -hmm. which is a word that i use all the time that we did not have on our list but what i mean is like everything is built for the camera (laughs) Mm -hmm. for the camera angle you're filming it from which is true for everything always right you know but but there is a difference between like you know he will stage things in in lateral moves the camera only moves in 90 degree movements left to right right to left or forward and backward always Mm -hmm. you know like there's a handful he's got a, a dogma that is so specific that it calls attention to itself and you can't help but notice and so you see the design. Right. This is another one of those terms that like, as soon as you start to boil down, it, it gets a little cringy. But basically you mean overt style. Right. Versus. Like extreme symmetry. Subliminal style. Yeah. Yeah. Extreme kind of colors. Yeah. Controlling of things. Yeah. I guess the, the thing I would think is like the opposite of presentational is when someone picks up something and you don't quite get a, a mm-hmm. good, very clear it, glimpse at it. It feels incidental. Yeah. The camera isn't in the exact right place to get the perfect angle on it or. Right. You know. Or yeah. you, you're you not cutting to a close up or, or an insert mm-hmm. of something. Or you just feel that the world just goes beyond the edges of the frame. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, lens flares, handheld cameras, that sort of stuff is, is what you're kind of trying to evoke. So it's like it's it's Wes Anderson opposite. versus Terrence Malick. Yeah. Yeah. Right. right. Is is when people say designed versus authentic, right? That tends to be what they mean, or at least what I mean. Yeah, more or less. Yeah, and yeah, and lighting especially, I think, is a way that you achieve something natural. You know, anytime there's a daylight scene, I guess if it's kind of naturally filmed, you know, the light is coming in through the windows or you're mm-hmm. outdoors and it's coming from the sun. But if it's designed, you know, maybe there's more of like a backlight or none of the things we're saying are rules, just kind of general ideas of how we think about things. Obviously you can have very naturalistic lighting and a very designed composition. And I would say maybe Wes Anderson is a good example of naturalistic lighting in highly designed compositions. I guess what I chafe against with this is that designed versus authentic makes it seem as though to your earlier point that like the handheld fly on the wall uh, photography or style is somehow easier or less planned or that you you don't think it through as much. And look, if you're literally shooting a documentary, that is true. You don't have to build a set. You're just walking in and shooting, right? But I think there's an implied level of precision that's required in a quote-unquote designed or composed piece that is not in this authentic or improvised world. And I don't love that necessarily right because i think that if you're doing it right it's all equally hard yeah (laughs) basically i mean you think of like a chris nolan you know fight scene Mm -hmm. like is that 
designed or is that kind of, you know, impro- like the, the camera's moving all over the place. It's handheld. Mm-hmm. It's hard to tell what's going on. But obviously each shot is carefully planned out. Maybe Paul Greengrass is like a better example of a director that kind of famous for the handheld fast action. Mm-hmm. Like things are happening and the camera's just trying to catch them happening. In both cases, people are working hard to make it seem as though we don't know literally every single beat that's going to happen and that the, that hasn't been lit perfectly to catch those things. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think just like we talked about something grounded versus broad or cinematic versus stylized and how sometimes we try to push those, those two angles, like the juxtaposition between those two things is what makes things entertaining and fun to mm-hmm. watch, like a really absurd premise and a really grounded performance. I think, the same thing can apply to what we're talking about now, like designed versus authentic, like a really carefully designed fight sequence, but filmed in a way that, you know, someone is just capturing this thing that's happening. Mm-hmm. Um, can like, like combining something that's improvised with something that's very art directed can mm-hmm. give you some really amazing results. Right. When you are, pushing elements of your filmmaking away from each other is when Mm -hmm. cool things can happen. You know, even when it comes to genre, when it comes to, or maybe it's just like even a way of helping yourself do the least on the nose thing. It forces you to rethink your approach on everything and and perhaps surprise people or, or come up with something new. Well, so the last thing we have on our list is almost a subset of what we've been talking about, which is lifestyle filmmaking versus docu style. And I think lifestyle probably is a term mostly used for like branded videos, YouTube videos, maybe commercials, mm-hmm. not really in your traditional narrative feature or episodic filmmaking. Yeah, but I, I think again, the, all of these terms yeah. are shorthand. And so in the moment in your scene, it would be totally reasonable to say like to your dp oh this shot's a little more lifestyle yeah and hopefully they know what you mean yeah or hey this sequence they're packing for this trip they don't want to leave but they have to because but they're in the hunger games i mean what are you gonna do you know so let's shoot this in a lifestyle way which to me is like the prettiest version of a documentary where you're allowed to say Mm -hmm. like hey can you turn around and can you do this and Mm -hmm. can you pack in front of the window in the light yeah yeah yeah, so that we can make it look pretty. Uh, and again, you know, we referenced the DSLR revolution earlier on with like a 5d shot at magic hour. Uh, I think a lot of our lifestyle aesthetic came from people getting their hands on real beautiful cameras and just shooting mm-hmm. themselves or their friends doing fun things like, like vlogging is. Yeah. Or even like you think of like a Levi's commercial where it's like a bunch of people in jeans are at a party jumping into a pool. That's like, to me, like the epitome of like lifestyle filmmaking, right? You have a shot list, I think. I've tried to do that. I'm, I'm not really good at that type of filmmaking, to be honest. A lot of it is about creating an environment for your actors, your talent, you know, to be doing something and then finding the right angles to shoot it from and then just having them do it over and over again, right? And then noticing that certain things are happening like, oh, you know, the two of you, you guys have a weird chemistry, like, what if you, both of you sit on the diving board, you know, and you just put your hand on her shoulder or whatever, you know, like it's like not improvised, but I think it's a, a filmmaking approach where you're being very opportunistic and you're not worrying about continuity. Mm-hmm. Right. I, like what, what's your idea of lifestyle? If I said, yeah, make, you know, go shoot some kind of lifestyle type of shots here. What would you think? Well, I mean, uh, two things come to mind to me or three things really. Uh, one, I totally agree. To uh, I too do not get hired to do lifestyle <laughs> shoots. <laughs> uh, but three, yeah, I think that it is. You nailed it with like it's basically you have a little bit of planned chaos, and then you a repeatability to like you know compose something that matches a certain aesthetic, right? So, so we have lifestyle in comparison to docu style, and there is. To, in my mind, a difference in so much as lifestyle is meant to feel more fashion, yeah, more... It's almost like the perf- perfect... You're always catching the right angle. 
and it's a funny thing at, at Ellen, I used to do B roll pieces f- that we would intercut with our interviews and our, or, you know, our big stunt or reveal or whatever. And that always ended up a little lifestyle, you know, that you would like put people in the exact right spot to be backlit or, you know, things like that. Mm-hmm. Whereas docu style, I think is less likely to be shot in slow motion. It's less quote unquote buttery. You're probably handheld and not on a gimbal, that sort of stuff. The, the irony about lifestyle versus docu style is that I think they do overlap the most part, quite a lot. I think they're originally. basically from a from a process perspective, they're exactly the same. It's just that lifestyle means gimbal, lifestyle <laughs> means slow mo, lifestyle means pretty, quote unquote, whereas docu style means incidental, handheld, snap zooms, or just just you know trying searching for the shots a little bit more, and has a has a more cinematic quote unquote aesthetic or a grittier aesthetic yeah right? yeah maybe grittier more real more yeah. authentic i mean i used to actually shoot a lot of lifestyle but, stuff but they're equally authentic or they're equally real i guess is what i'm saying a documentarian can certainly say like hey can you flip that page again one more time yeah whereas like i think or, what we yeah, really you're, need is like you're having this conversation go can you have it in front of this window or whatever right exactly Whereas verite or like dogma, I think verite, I think is it's been a while since um, my film school days, but I think that was more like you're supposed to literally be a fly on the wall, do everything within your power to avoid influencing the thing you're documenting in any way or any capacity. Right. And I think that's a journalism thing. (laughs) Right. And like YouTubers don't give a shit about that. And so that's kind of changed the way that we we make films, basically. I used to shoot a lot of stuff like for Teen Vogue and things like that. And we would take like a like Kiernan Shipka, you know, she's the Mm -hmm. daughter from Mad Men. What what does she do on the weekends? She likes to go get ice cream at Larchmont and she her and her two friends like ride bikes, you know, down Mm -hmm. the sidewalk or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like that's kind of something that maybe they did like once or twice. But in what we filmed, it's like, hey. We're going to have you ride your bikes like four times and you guys are having fun. Like you're laughing, Mm -hmm. like you're doing that point over there. And you time it to when the the light is and like, yeah, you clean up their bikes. And And then we go to the ice cream and we tell the ice cream shop, Hey, we're going to film here. Can we, is there a good table? Can you make us like really beautiful scoops of ice cream Mm -hmm. and can, okay, now you guys are going to sit here. Let's walk with the ice cream a little bit. And it's like, you know, we do a few shots and like one of them is lactose intolerant. She's not even eating her ice cream. You know, Mm -hmm. it's basically Mm -hmm. built for the camera and I, I filmed with like other like pop star type people where we're like at their house and we're like, let's get a few shots of you, you know, making eggs or whatever. Okay. You broke two eggs, you put some cream in there we're done. Let's move on, on to the next thing. Mm-hmm. In a documentary, they would probably really make the eggs, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's the other, like kind of the staging. But again, I think most of what we're talking about, it's like how we accomplish these looks. But at the end of the day, uh, if you're pitching or describing like how something is going to look when you say lifestyle, it is just like a pretty version of a documentary. I think if there's a thing for listeners to to take away from this conversation, it's that we've had 40 minutes of this conversation and Oren and I know each other very well. We've talked at least once a week for like six years and we did not truly wholeheartedly agree about what we meant by any of those terms. We were close. We were close. But I, I guess the point is, is that like you have to have a, a vocabulary as a starting off point to drill into things. But like these terms are all just kind of catchphrases that are the gateway into the specificity of every single nuance that we're trying to work through. Just to double down on what you're saying, if you are a new filmmaker that is pitching people that's trying to get work as a commercial director, as a, any type of director, you know, you're pitching to direct an episode of TV or whatever. Having these words and having strong ideas of what you mean by them is really helpful as part of your tool set as a filmmaker is describing style because I think it's one of the earliest parts of the job where earliest faces. Yeah. And I think a lot of people aren't good at it. (laughs) Like new Mm -hmm. filmmakers don't think it's important. And a lot of people with the money have different definitions. And when Mm -hmm. I say people with the money, I mean people that are going to hire you to make whatever you're making. And so, I don't know, we just thought it would be helpful to talk about some of these words, what we mean by them, what other people might mean by them, and how you can use them. And 
I do think that at the end of the day, even what we talked about, broad premises versus grounded performances and those things can inspire you to find ways to make more interesting or unique material. Agreed. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for going over the glossary of some filmmaking terms with me. Digging in, man. If you listeners are into episodes like this, it's kind of a craft episode, but it's I just think of it as a glossary of filmmaking terms that everyone should know. I'm sure there's many terms that I should know that I don't know as well. But if you're into these kind of lists of things that we think about and care about, let us know. We enjoy making these topic-centric episodes. We'd love to hear feedback on this is working for you. Or if you'd rather us talk to someone that had a movie at South by Southwest about how they got Daniel DeVito. Get ready, because a couple are coming. Daniel DeVito. Did I just say? Danny <laughs> DeVito. <laughs> to be in their movie. Do you have uh, any time to endorse something with me? I do indeed. Unpaid endorsements. So my unpaid endorsement is the new book, Blood, Sweat, and Chrome, The Wild and True Story of Mad Max Fury Road. It's an oral history of Mad Max Fury Road, top 10 favorite films of all time. I really, really, really love that movie. And it's a wild story of how they made it. It took George Miller two decades to get it done. He's an Oscar winning filmmaker, Mad Max made a bajillion dollars and was a you know an indie film and it's just kind of nice to be reminded of how hard it is to make a movie even when you've got everything going for you and also george miller's like a real honest to goodness artist i love all those movies even thunderdome but uh fury road is my favorite i really love that one so blood sweat and chrome the story of mad max fury road uh is a treat so i have two things that will blow your mind <laughs> If you happen to live anywhere near a Trader Joe's, <laughs> there are two new new items I've fallen in love with. One is <laughs> one is like obvious, like of course anyone would love it. It's the dark chocolate almond butter filled pretzel nuggets. They're as good as they sound. So delicious. Dark chocolate almond filled almond pretzel butter nugget filled almond pretzel butter. Nuggets. Yeah. Ah ha ha! I see. So it's a pretzel so, filled with almond butter, but it's covered in dark chocolate. Yeah, that's just the perfect. Good. Balance. Okay, but that, that's an obvious one. The real mind blower is a new chip they have. I challenge anyone that listens to this podcast that goes to Trader Joe's to buy this item and not eat it in one sitting. Mm. It's an entire bag of chips. It's the organic elote corn chip dippers with a Mexican style street corn seasoning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm down. It's like I'm down. crack cocaine. I've had. My dad's visiting me from Israel. I gave him one, ate the whole bag. I had one. My wife gave, she's the one that bought them originally. But I ate one, ate the whole bag, gave my daughter, my six-year-old daughter one. She ate the whole bag. Well, so wa walk us through this elote uh, seasoning here situation. Is this like, it's like a tahini, like lemon, lime, like spicy lime sort of situation? Is it sour creamy or mayonnaise-y elote can go a couple different ways i have ways. no idea it's just delicious just buy it mm. I, I can't describe it i cannot describe it but i <laughs> highly recommend also getting they have like this pre-packaged guacamole <laughs> which mm -hmm. i know is probably uh you don't like to hear about things like that matt mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. people actually buy them but they have mm -hmm. they're actually you can freeze them and mm. it's guacamole lasts like 15 minutes this stuff lasts like Mm. You can use this half of it and put it in the fridge mm. and then use it again the next day. It's amazing. Tastes pretty much like guacamole. It is guacamole. I, I can um, actually freeze my turds and they <laughs> taste just like turds the next day. It's pretty cool. But uh, yeah, organic elote corn chip dippers. You must try them from Trader Joe's. You will uh, gain five pounds by the end of the week. They're so Are good. you an elote guy? Do you like like street corn? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I like elote. Elote. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Oren, this was so great. Uh, what a wonderful episode. If you have questions or comments, if you have any feedback for us, you can email us at justshootitpod at gmail.com or tweet at us at justshootitpod. We're across all social media at justshootitpod. Uh, drop us an iTunes review. That's super helpful as well. Yeah, or randomly um, send us a message on Instagram telling us how big of a fan you are of the podcast. Anyway, you can follow me at Mr. Bad. I know you can all send all of your hate mail to at O Kaplan. Uh, I'm at O Kaplan on Instagram. No, we love to hear from you. We love our listeners. This episode was edited by Noah Bayshore. And the music you're listening to is from the Free Music Archive and the artist Jazar. And we will catch you next time. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.